Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Christ Lutheran Vale Church. I'm Pastor David Hook. Today is an online version of our worship service, and today our church is gathering together online to celebrate today's worship service. Uh, we have also ways that you can connect during the week. We have a CLV Facebook page and an Instagram channel and a website. And all of these things have been put together to help you grow in your faith. Uh, if you're new to us, we'd love to hear more about you. You can text the word welcome uh, to our phone number that's displaying on the screen right now. And we'll send you information about our church and other ways for you to stay connected during the week. And hopefully we can learn more about how we can serve you. Now, we belong to a group of churches in California, Arizona, and Nevada. And as part of that consortium of churches, we elect a person to kind of help lead us and guide us. And today we will hear a special message from that person. His name is Mike Gibson, and we are so excited to have him share a message with us this morning. But before we get into that message, uh, if you are online, please uh, go ahead and take some time to say hello to each other. Uh, in the Facebook comments or on the YouTube comments, and then we will sing some songs and we will get into it. So have a blessed week and we'll see you soon. Grace, what have you done? Since of wrong, from sin washed away in your blood. Too much to make sense of it all. I know that your love breaks my fall. The scandal of grace, you died in my place. So
because of you, Jesus, it's all. Because of you, Jesus, it's all. Because of your love that my soul will live. And it's all. Because of you, Jesus, it's all. Because of you, Jesus, it's all Because of your love that my soul will live Would you be like me? Give all I have just to know you Jesus, there's no the world It couldn't fill me A man's empty praise and treasures of fate are never enough And you came along And put me back together Every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing. You 
The early church gathered together for the apostles' teaching, for fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayer. And one of the other things that the early church did was they pooled their resources together to help those in need. And that's why we exist at Christ Within Veil Church, is to pool our resources together so that we can do these things, and so that we can help to create loving disciples in our community and love our community. Uh, if you would like to be part of our mission statement, you can uh, do that by helping Go to our website right now and you can learn about ways that you can serve uh, and learn about ways that you can give back to our community and give to our church. Uh, and we'll give you an opportunity to do that right now if you'd like. We thank God for all of the many blessings that he provides for us in doing work, his hands and feet in the community. And now we're going to hear a message from Mike Gibson, who is the president of the Pacific Southwest District of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. And he's going to share some words for us this morning. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Merry Christmas. Hi, I'm Mike Gibson, and it's my privilege to serve as District President of the Pacific Southwest District of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. And it's my honor to be able to be your preacher today on this Sunday after Christmas. You all have had a very busy week, haven't you? Between Advent services followed immediately by the Christmas Eve celebrations, Christmas Day and Sunday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. That's a lot for any church. And Boy, is it a lot for your pastor. I hope you are loving on your pastor for the faithful service that he brings to you and to your congregation every single day, but especially all the extra effort that goes in to this Christmas season. Make sure you love him well. Well, when I think about the Sunday after Christmas, it always reminds me more of a personal story because for me, it's about the heart of a mom, heart of a mother, uh, I think about those years uh, that Kathy and I served in uh, ministry in our various locations. And on those Sundays after Christmas, it was often kind of one of those low attendance Sundays. I hope it's not that way at your place today. And so we would sometimes have trouble finding readers who would fit into the schedule. And so people would often say, oh, well, we can count on Kathy Gibson. She'll be there. And so she can read the gospel lead readings or the readings for that Sunday after Christmas. And so she would invariably be the reader for the day. But then there's those years in the lectionary cycle when the reading for the Sunday after Christmas covers that section of Matthew. We're looking at Luke 2 today, but Matthew 2, because it's that part where it tells the story how Herod, once he knows that he's been tricked by the Magi, decides he's going to kill off all the little boys, two years old and younger, in the entire area around Bethlehem. And I remember that Sunday when Kathy began to read, and then all of a sudden, you heard her voice choke up. And she stopped, and she was having trouble speaking. And I could tell there were tears in her eyes coming down her cheeks because she was starting to read the words that are quoted out of Jeremiah 31. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they were no more. 
And my dear wife in that moment refused to be comforted. The identification of a mother and the loss of her children probably wasn't a good idea to ask the mother of two little boys in my family to be the reader on that particular Sunday. So what do we do? I, I did what anybody I think would have done. I got up, went over, put my arm around my wife, kind of pulled her in close, and I finished the reading for her. And it, that's one of those memories that sticks with us today. And it's really what I think of, as I said earlier, about the heart of a mother that's truly at work on this Sunday after Christmas. Now, now that brings us to our text. We've had the nativity, and now it's 40 days later, because now on that 40th day, Mary and Joseph and the baby Jesus are going up to Jerusalem. It's only a few miles from Bethlehem, but they're going up to the temple in order to offer a sacrifice for, it says there, that's plural, purification. The Bible says in Luke chapter 2, hear these words, part of our gospel lesson for today. When the time had come for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who first opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And then to be able to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord. And while it says here in our text, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons, it was also could have been lambs. But Mary and Joseph, they don't have these resources. And so the options of the birds are the ones that they choose. So they are living out these requirements that were established in the book of Leviticus in chapter 12 to bring a sacrifice. Sacrifice for what? Well, for Mary, it was considered that with the birth of a child that she was then ceremonially unclean. And after 40 days, she could go and offer sacrifice in the temple and be declared ceremonially clean again. For the baby, it was offered as a sacrifice to redeem that baby, to give thanks to God, but then to, as they offered him to God, to bring him back so that he might serve and live and function within the life of their family. But it's interesting here that that kind of sacrifice would even be offered for Jesus. Now, now why did that happen? Well, because Jesus fulfilled every single requirement of the law for us even including that sacrifice for that birth of that child in the early parts of Leviticus and those requirements. But here's the truth we want to hold on to. The one who had a sacrifice offered for his redemption becomes for us our redemptive sacrifice so that we might be bought back from sin, so that we might have that relationship with our God because of Jesus Christ. This is a remarkable message of good news. Even as that sacrifice is offered for Jesus, the world is receiving the sacrificial lamb that is brought to the temple in that day, on that 40th day after his birth, for exactly the purpose of redemption. The Redeemer is here. You ever thought about those times, uh, if you're a parent, when others speak to you about your child? Uh, now, I'm not talking about those moments when the principal calls you up at school and you got to go in and you got to meet with your principal because of some misbehavior. Um, nor am I talking about those moments uh, like happened in our lives uh, when I was, was reported to me from our head elder that our second child, our little four-year-old at the time, when the head elder had told him that he needed to go back and sit with his mom, because, of course, I was up front doing worship, our son Tim looked at him and he said, I can do anything I want around here. My dad owns this place. We've never forgotten that one. But what I'm talking about are those moments you've had these probably, when your child's been at an overnighter, and when you go to pick them up at the friend's house the next morning, the parent says to you, what an amazing child you have, so well behaved, so polite. Oh, we just thought it was a joy to have him here or her here. And you're thinking for a moment, now you must have the wrong parent and child in mind. When in reality, you catch yourself in a moment, you kind of pull yourself up a little higher and say, yep, that's my boy. It's good to know that when he's not with mom and dad, 
other people see these things about him too. And that's what happens in this text. Because when Mary and Joseph show up in the temple, old Simeon, now everybody knew him because he was always around, old Simeon, who's been hanging out in the temple area, the Bible says, because he has been waiting to see the Lord's Christ, the Messiah, the one who's been promised. And God had said to him that he would not die until he had seen the Messiah. And it says that Simeon took Jesus in his arms and he blessed God, saying, and this is from our liturgy after communion when we sing, Lord, now let your servant depart in peace. These are the words of Simeon in that moment. He says, Lord, now let your servant depart in peace according to your word, according to your promise that you gave me. For my eyes have seen your salvation. I'm holding this child. This is the salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all people a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory for your people Israel. Imagine Joseph and Mary in that moment reflecting on all the things that they had heard over the last year, the angels that had spoken to both of them, the angels that had offered them peace and confidence, the promise of God's fulfillment. And here in this moment, for the first time, this random person named Simeon comes to them and confirms what they already know that they have experienced privately and intimately and says, this is the savior of the world. And then there's a remarkable thing that happens. Simeon turns to Mary and speaks directly into her heart, that heart of a mother again. Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed and then he gives a parenthetical when he says, and a sword will pierce through your own soul also, so that the thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. Now, of course, he was speaking about the saving work of Jesus, the truth of God that would create this division and separation so that people might hear that there is a truth, there is a Savior, there is forgiveness of our sins, there is this Savior that Simeon is holding in his arms. And yet in the same breath, Simeon says to Mary, and it will pierce your heart. How will it pierce his, her heart? Because she will watch 30 years from now, 33 years from now, her son beaten, crucified, and buried, her heart pierced, and yet she will also watch him raised from the dead. I, I love the Christmas song, Mary, did you know? Did you know that you were holding the Son of God? Did you know that when you kissed him, you kissed the face of God? And the answer for me is, you bet she did because God made sure to confirm and to bring other voices into her life to help her know and hold on to, from Elizabeth who greeted her when her baby leapt in her womb, to Simeon in this moment, to the angels, to the shepherds. And it was going to be a message that the entire world and all of time was going to hear but it needed to grow out of this moment of the declaration that the Savior had come. Now, they're not done yet, because immediately into this setting comes Anna, the prophetess. Now, now think of this for a minute. It says that Anna had lived with her husband for seven years before his death. And if she'd been married, which was common at the time, between 13, 14, 15 years old, and then lived with her husband for seven years, she could have been anywhere from 20 to 23. And then she lived for over 60 years as a widow in service at the temple. And the Bible says this, that she never departed because she was worshiping and fasting with prayer daily, every day and night, waiting to see the Redeemer, the redemption of Israel. And in that moment, she gave thanks to God just as Simeon had done. 
And coming up at that very hour, the Bible says in Luke chapter 2, verse 38, she began to give thanks to God and to speak of him to all who were waiting for the redemption of Israel. Now think about that. This is the Redeemer, the one we have been waiting for. Simeon had just said, I'm holding the Savior in my arms. And Anna looks and says, this is the one promise, the one we've been waiting for, who will pay the price, who will redeem, who had just offered that sacrifice of redemption, but would offer the ultimate sacrifice of redemption for all of our sins. All of these things, shouting loudly in Simeon and Anna's voice, the Redeemer is here. And all of these things are spoken into the heart of this loving set of parents, uh, a mother and an adoptive father, two people that the angels had spoken to who knew who this child was, and yet it was this confirmation and that certainty that these random folks that they ran into into the temple, God made sure to begin the message of proclamation to others. I want to make sure that you take three things home with you today. Here's the first one, and it's from my heart and my lips to you, a random guy who's preaching on video on a Sunday morning to you. Here it is. Your Redeemer is here. Your Savior Jesus Christ that Simeon held in his arms and Anna recognized, he is here. He is the one who has sacrificed for you the forgiveness of your sins so that you might have a relationship with God, that you might live in the dynamic reality of his incredible love for you, that you would know that there's never a moment when your Emmanuel is apart from you. He is God with you. And this is the Savior who will be with you every day of all of your life until he takes you into the wonders of heaven. You see, that's the gift of your Redeemer. You and I can't do what it takes in order to earn our salvation. And so he comes for us so that we might have the forgiveness of our sins. Here's the second thing I want to make sure you know, and that is there is peace for you. Peace for the forgiveness of your sins. Peace for the life that you live because here's the thing, as Simeon knew and understood, Lord, now that my eyes have seen your salvation, let me depart in peace. Why? Because all the things that matter the most are settled, confident and certain that I have this gift of God's love for me and the peace that lives out every single day, a gift of contentment and confidence in a God who is with me. Thirdly, I encourage you to speak about this child to everyone. This is the joy of what Anna did. She spoke to everyone about the promised Redeemer that was here. And he's here. He's here for you. He's here for me. He's here for the world. And it's our prayer that you would continue to proclaim this message in these days after Christmas that the Savior of the world has come. As I wrap up my time with you today, I just want to tell you a little simple story and illustration. Uh, just recently, Kathy and I hosted district presidents from different places in our Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, really good friends and people who I serve with in ministry and primarily what we call the saltwater districts, those that are on the edge of our country. And we get together for an annual retreat every December. As we prepared for it, um, we were going to host a, a kickoff dinner on the Sunday night. And so we did all that things that you do when you have a special bunch of people come into the house. We did the deep dive and cleaning. Uh, and while the event of, was going to certainly take place in just our first floor of the house, we even went upstairs and we went into the bedrooms and we did all this stuff just in case you needed that extra bathroom or an adventurous guest, and you've probably done it before, goes on a self-guided tour of the house. Uh, well, when I got to the top of my dresser in my bedroom, I realized I hadn't touched that thing in a while. Boy, it was dusty and it had clutter and it had all that kind of stuff that comes out of your pocket. And yet what I also found on that was a stack of gift cards that were unredeemed. I just learned the other day that this year, 39% of shoppers are going to purchase a department store gift card or some store, like 
Amazon for their friends and family. And then about another 33% are going to buy some kind of a restaurant gift card. And according to estimates, the typical American family today has $300 worth of unredeemed cards in their possessions. And somebody did a study that over a period of seven years, there were $41 billion in gift cards in the United States of America that were going unused. What are you going to do with the redemption that God has given you? Don't leave it unused. Receive this gift that God has for you of his Savior. If it's one that you've known forever, make sure you're living it out, trusting, receiving the wonderful blessings and gifts that God has. It's my prayer that you will have a glorious Christmas season, New Year, an opportunity to bring the message to the world that your Redeemer is here. Let's pray together. God, our Father, I thank you so much for the gift that you've given us of Jesus, our Redeemer, the Savior, the one that Israel had waited for, but now the one that we know the world needs so desperately. God, our Father, thank you for the gift that it is for each of us, the forgiveness of our sins, the wonder of what it means to be called children of God. But Lord God, we thank you also that you have given us a message and a hope to the world the Redeemer is here, peace is real, and that a message can be shared to all. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for the privilege of being with you this morning. We thank Mike for his great words. And uh, other than that, we are going to be closed at the church office this week. And so if you have, uh, if you want to come and contact us at the church office, make sure you call ahead to make sure somebody's there. But most of us are going to be gone for most of the week. Uh, but you can still reach the office by calling the church phone number and uh, somebody will get back to you. Other than that, uh, we will get back together live and in person at 8.30 and 10 o'clock next week. So may you have a blessed week. Go in peace and serve the Lord with joy. Thanks be to God.